I, I've said to this to um, to Brother Muhammad Hijab privately, and I don't think it's a problem me saying it here, but. Um, Awesome. All right. We're live. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. We've got an amazing, amazing guest, esteemed guest, Jake, the Muslim metaphysician. Um, really, really, uh, really excited to have you here, to be honest. We've been following you for quite some time, just your content overall. Uh, most not most noticeably, you were on uh, PBD as of late, late as well, as well as Talk TV. Uh, so we're just going to be talking a little bit about that. But before we get into it, Maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do. Um, I know you've done a lot of different things over the last few years, so maybe just a quick summary of, of what, what you've been up to. Yeah, sure. So, um, Salam Alaikum, thanks for having me on, and it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, my name is Jake. Uh, also go by the Muslim Metaphysician, as you mentioned. Uh, I have my own YouTube channel, I'm, uh, which we may get into more details into my story, but I'm a revert to Islam. So my family's Catholic. I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and I accepted Islam um, over 10 years ago now. Um, wow, when I think about it, it's been a long time, but uh, alhamdulillah. And uh, now I focus um, mainly in Dawah. Um, so my channel is primarily focused with uh, Dawah. I talk about theology, whether it be Islamic theology, Christian theology, um, debating with atheists, uh, skeptics. Uh, recently, with everything that's going on, unfortunately, in Palestine, I've been trying to expose the Zionists and uh, some of the games that they're up to. And, uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a brief summary of what I do and, and some of the topics I discuss. Perfect, perfect. I know that you've uh, also been involved with the uh, Sapiens Institute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your work over there? What was your experience uh, being involved with them? Yeah, so um, Sapiens Institute, uh, run by Brother Hamza and Muhammad Hijab, um, they invited me to teach a few courses on Christian theology. So if anybody's interested, um, you know, not necessarily to plug myself, but Sapiens in general, um, you can go on the learning platform. And uh, I have two courses there, as well as there's plenty of other, dozens of other great courses uh, from other Muslims. Um, but my two courses focused on Christian theology and early Christian history. And I focused on the doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the Incarnation. And I go through a lot of detail. I mean, uh, between the two courses, it's almost something like 30 hours. Um, yeah, so... Um, what. Basically, they invited me to London. Uh, I went over there. They were very gracious um, in, you know, paying for everything for me to be there. And um, spent about two or three weeks recording the classes. Um, it was really uh, grueling. It was <laughs> a bit of a difficult schedule. But alhamdulillah, we got it done. And uh, yeah, so if people want, they can... They can go check out my courses. When you sign up, everything's free. All you have to do is sign up with your email address. And um, when you go on there, uh, I'm primarily teaching from like a PowerPoint presentation. And you get to download the PowerPoint presentations for free. It's awesome. got something like almost 700 slides. So there's a lot of information. Um, but yeah, that, that, was my, uh, that was my role with Sapiens. And then since then, um, they have a Lighthouse mentoring program. Mm -hmm. in which it's also free, great platform that I recommend. Uh, people can go on there and sign up, and you can schedule uh, an hour time slot uh, in which if you're a Muslim that is having doubts uh, about Islam or certain questions, you can go on there and ask questions. Um, and you speak to somebody like me, although right now I'm not volunteering for the program, but I have previously. I'm just really too busy at the moment. But they have plenty of other brothers on there that are more than capable. Um, if you're a non-Muslim and you have questions about Islam, you can go on there and ask questions. Um, what Really, whatever. I mean, as long as you're not there to play games, uh, yeah. you can go on there and ask uh, genuine questions. And it's a one-on-one -on -one interaction, uh, completely, well, not completely anonymous, but pretty much. 
And um, yeah, it, it's really great. Uh, the platform has been growing. So uh, previously I had uh, been a volunteer on uh, the Lighthouse Mentoring Program, but right now I'm not doing it just because I'm, I'm too busy at the moment. But yeah. those were my roles with uh, Sapiens, teaching the courses and volunteering for the Lighthouse Mentoring Program. Is that, is that how you first got involved with uh, Muhammad Hijab, Hamza Tortiz and the crew? Or did you get involved um, well, prior to that? Well, I had known them uh, prior to that, but um, because of my interest in Christian theology and the amount of work that I had been putting in, um, I think they thought that I was a good fit to teach those courses, and so they reached out to me. We had already been in contact, um, and we had Hamza Sources on our YouTube channel. I, I was part of a YouTube channel called TAP. Uh, thought adventure podcast and we had invited brother hamza on there a couple times i think before that so i, I had known them uh but not in that intimate fashion I, I was able to meet them in person all of the brothers muhammad hijab ali dawa hamza sources all the brothers um in person uh, it's going on over two years ago now and so i've had a re relationship with them and been in touch with them ever since uh, but yeah, that was really the first time meeting them in person and getting to know them in a lot more detail. I know with the with the PBD podcast, um, initially it was supposed to be like different guests, and then eventually something happened, and then you got to sub in with I think Daniel. Um, how, can you give us a bit of context mm -hmm. there? Like how 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 was the experience with the PBD podcast? Like how was your prep? When were you giving the heads up? Was it a last minute thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was uh, it was it was a last minute thing. As far as I understand it, and what I've been told is that originally it was supposed to be Brother Muhammad Hijab and Adi Dawa were gotcha. supposed to go on to the program. And I think they experienced some complications receiving um, their visas to be able to enter the U.S. I'm not sure exactly what happened because um, I wasn't given the details about that, but there was some kind of complication. And they weren't going to be able to make it on the originally scheduled date that they had agreed to. And so, of course, they asked um, to reschedule. But for whatever reason, uh, the PBD podcast did not want to reschedule. Um, their narrative was that they already made arrangements for the other guests to be there on that day. And they had paid out some money, you know. And so it was going to be too difficult for them to reschedule. At least that's what they claimed. Um, so they, at that point, they gave a, an alternative to uh, Hijab and Ali Dawa. They said, look, we're just going to go ahead with it. Um, we can't reschedule. We need to do it on this particular day that we've already agreed to. And so they said, you have two options. Either you, you guys can reach out to two other Muslims that you think um, would be good defenders of the Islamic position and, and come on here. In, in replacement of you guys, or we're just going to find two of them ourselves. And so at that point, um, they said, well, you know, if that's our only options, we're going to try to figure out two replacements because, to be honest, they didn't really trust the PBD podcast. They thought, oh, right. well, maybe, the, you know, at least if it's in their hands, they can get what they think are two decent representations of Islam and uh and defending the muslim position rather than having these guys bring on you know two people that may be not as qualified to to do so so at that point um as far as i understand it anyway uh brother hijab and ali dawa they met with their uh, immediate circle that they have that they trust people like hamza sources and some other people which i'm, I'm not going to mention because i don't think they have and um from what I understand, they, they basically all gave their input and they took a vote on uh, who were going to be the two replacements. And it turned out that uh, Daniel and myself were uh, the ones that basically won out, that they received the most votes. And um, I mean, look, so, I think I speak for a lot of people when I say you guys wiped the floor with them. So <laughs> <Allah> <laughs> <wa shafad, yani. laughs> it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will that you guys were there because who knows, but you guys absolutely killed it did you guys know the topics or guests that were going to be on the pvd podcast with you guys right so then at that point once these guys uh these brothers um voted and and uh, 
had chosen us, it's actually interesting that uh, Daniel and I received a call uh, the very same weekend that was right before the PBD podcast was scheduled. I gotcha. believe, if memory serves me correct, that uh, we went on a Thursday. It was scheduled on a Thursday. And I had received a call on Saturday. This is this Saturday before, so less than a week beforehand. And it just so turns out that that very same weekend, Daniel and I were actually together in person at another event. Uh, we were debating two atheists. Uh, Daniel was debating uh, Matt Dillahunty. Some viewers may know him. Uh, he's a popular atheist in the U.S. And I was debating Aaron Ra, uh, another popular uh, American atheist. And so we were actually at the same event, and we received a call on the same day, I think. Uh, and I, after I got off the call, actually, Brother Abdullah Al-Andalusi called me, and he said, look, Jake, uh, he explained everything that I just said already. I don't want to be repetitive. And he said, are you, are you able to make it next Thursday? And at the time, um, I was working um, I, I, since, and maybe we can talk about that more, I've actually quit my job and I'm doing Dawa full time. Uh, but at that time, I thought it was going to be difficult because I said, well, I just took off this weekend from my job. I don't know if I'm going to be able to swing it uh, without you know, enough notice. But I said, I'll see what I can do. And um, so anyway, I tentatively agreed to do it. And I spoke to Daniel. I said, oh, Daniel, did you get a call about this? And he said, oh, yeah, they just called me yesterday. So it's funny because that was actually my first time meeting Brother Daniel in person as well. And, um, you know, called that a law. It just happened that um, they called us both to, to, to come to this event. And so then at that point, you know, we started uh, making the arrangements and I was in touch with uh, PBD, uh, not him directly, but um, the person who does the bookings for the, the channel and everything. And his name was Rob. He was a nice guy. Um, and... At that point, the only thing we really knew, we knew that there were going to be two people on the show, that it was going to be Robert Spencer and this guy uh, who calls himself Brother Rashid. And um, I didn't know at the time too much about the Brother Rashid guy, so I started looking into him on YouTube and seeing what he was about, and I wasn't too impressed. Um, and, yeah, we, we only thing we really knew is it was, it was supposed to be just very broad, they told us, Christianity versus Islam, and it was going to be me and Daniel and these two guys. That's really all we knew. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, and so suffice to say, of course, Yanni, Michelle, you guys still, uh, as Abdullah pointed out, crushed it, which is uh, it's a, it's a big now. testament to your guys' ability to still adapt to any type of situation, especially in Dawah. You kind of had to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's honestly a, a very uh, impressive feat overall. Um, was mm -hmm. that what kind of led to you appearing afterwards on Talk TV, or did it have like a, a role to play in it? Or how did the Talk TV uh, appearance come come forth? Yeah. So interestingly enough, and and I, I I've said to this to um, to Brother Muhammad Hijab privately, and I don't think it's a problem me saying it here, but. Um, Really, it was because of him and his efforts that uh, Daniel and I went on to the PBD podcast, which was a big opportunity for us because, uh, I mean, I'm sure most of the guests know, but it's a big platform. With We knew a lot of people were going to view the program. So um, I really appreciated that. And for somebody like him to say to himself, look, well, if I can't be there, I'm going to try to put other people that I think will do a decent job in our place. Um, I think that that was really admirable for him and, and Ali Dawa to do. So I really appreciated that. And I, I let them know because some people, you know, I know it's supposed to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but yeah. you know, egos get involved and they may think, Oh, well, you know, we don't want to send these guys. I mean, let's try to force them to reschedule so we can be on there ourselves, but they didn't do that. And so hats off to them. Um, and, you know, called that Allah because of that, you, you know, this is my own interpretation of events, Allahu Adam. But, um, a few months later, um, brother Muhammad Hijab, and unfortunately the October 7th event happened 
a couple weeks after we were on the PBD podcast. So everything kind of changed towards uh, Palestine and everything that's been going on there since. Right. Um, and Pierce Morgan started doing all of these interviews about uh, Palestine and everything. And eventually it led to uh, him inviting Brother Muhammad Hijab on there, which is an even bigger platform uh, than PBD. And so, um, you know, I, I look at it as, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, partly at least because of Muhammad Hijab having the humility to allow us to uh, take his place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated him and give him an even bigger opportunity. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. So, so he went on there. And then through that, I think he went on there two times and he established somewhat of a relationship with the people there and they asked him they actually approached him and asked him and they said look we would like to have other muslim guests on and this is before the muslims were boycotting pierce morgan which happened later um mm -hmm. because of his behavior and his antics but um uh prior to that they had asked uh, brother muhammad hijab look we would like to have more muslim and pro-palestinian guests on do you have any recommendations uh you know in mind and so he um, listed me as one of those people, and eventually I was contacted uh, by Talk TV, which at the time was associated with Pierce Morgan. I mean, all of this stuff happens quickly when you think about it. Yeah, uh, now probably. Pierce Morgan actually broke away from Talk TV as a network, which is owned by uh, Rupert Murdoch, the guy who runs Fox and is owned by Fox, uh, owns Fox. And... Um, so they, they reached out to me and they asked me if I would be uh, willing to be on. And actually, I was on the road at that time. Uh, I live in New Jersey, so I was in Chicago actually giving a lecture at a mosque in Chicago. And um, so that was a bit difficult scheduling, but I was able to swing it. And that's how I got on again, actually, through uh, a recommendation from Brother Muhammad Hijab. So shout out to him. What well, what was your prep like for both of those? So like game day, walk me through if you can, if you remember it. Like, uh, mm -hmm. how much time do you put into preparing for these things? Yeah. So um, with the PBD podcast, I had about let's say five days worth of notice, and I mean most of my preparation preparation was a really scouting because I heard already been familiar with the PBD podcast. I had been watching their shows for quite some time so i was familiar with the format i was familiar with patrick and the other people that are usually on there and how the show basically went right i brushed up on a little bit of that i i watched more of their recent podcasts to just get a feel of of, of how it went and uh but really the main bulk of my time i spent watching videos of robert spencer and this guy um he calls himself Brother Rashid. Uh, and I had been more familiar with Robert Spencer because he's a career Islamophobe, has been writing yeah. books against Islam for a long time. He's more known in the English space, uh, but I don't follow the Arabic space as much. And this guy, Brother Rashid, is known as like this murtad in the uh, Arabic realm. And so I had watched a bunch of videos for him just to get more of a familiarity with them. And so I listed out what I thought were going to be their key objections to Islam, what they would want to talk about, what they thought that their strengths were, um, what I identified as their points of weakness, and I was going to try to attack them. And what I knew was going to happen, I knew that Patrick was going to try to come off as a as much of an unbiased host as he possibly could. And I think he yep. did a pretty good job of that. But I knew that he was going to try to steer the conversation in a way that attempted to favor the Christian side. And what did he do by that? If, if you go back to the PBD podcast, the very first question he asks um, to start off the actual conversation, he says to Robert Spencer, so Robert, tell us what are your actual biggest problems with islam right and what are your biggest objections with islam so okay fair enough you would think all right he asked that then when the muslim side attempts to respond to them then he would come back and say okay jake right. since you left christianity right or daniel since you're not a christian 
what is your biggest objection or, or problems with Christianity? Mm-hmm. He didn't do that. He just went on from uh, asking about their objections to Christianity to other problems that they had and other avenues at attacking Islam. So I had suspected that that was going to be the case, and so I was ready for what I would call a counterpunch um, or counterattack approach. You know, um, it's kind of like if people are familiar with boxing, right? There are certain uh, counterpunchers in which their offense is really their best defense. They try to evade the attack and then quickly respond with a jab or something like that. And so that was my approach. Um, And when they started off, Robert Spencer, with giving his criticisms of Islam, I took his criticism and used it to turn it on its head to then uh, put him in a position and attack his position. Because I knew that I wasn't going to get you know, my own opportunity for Patrick to ask them questions and say, you know, difficulties with Christianity. So I knew I was going to have to quickly respond to what they said and then on the back end of my response, turn it into now an objection and a question towards them. So I had to pose my own questions to try to get the conversation going into our favor. And that was my strategy for the PBD podcast. But before I go on to the Talk TV one, I don't know if you guys have any comments yeah, on that. I do remember you doing that, to be very honest. And I felt like that was the right move at the time because the reality is if you didn't do something like that, they would have just carried on with the conversation and essentially mm-hmm. controlled it. But because it was kind of a blindsided type of punch, yeah, they I don't think they expected it. They didn't... No, like they if you ready. rewatch it, he didn't know how to respond to it, frankly speaking. Like yeah. he was struggling, right? So mm-hmm. no, that was definitely masterful. So what about what about the talk TV one? Like, what was that prep like? Was it a completely different one, or was it similar where you watched ho- the host a little bit of the show, like the recent stuff, and then you were just like, okay, you know, let me brush up about the topic now, and then, bam, go time. What was that yeah, like? Yeah, it, it was very similar, um, although it was a little bit different for me because um, I had more experience debating Islam and Christianity. And hadn't right. had as much experience debating politics and specifically in the realm of Palestine, so-called Israel. Mm-hmm. So that was new for me. And really, at the time that I went on, it was probably at the height of, or maybe just slightly after the height of all of the controversy that had been going on. And really, to be quite honest, I was, I was more nervous than when I went on the PVD podcast. Right, okay. And it was partly because of, as I said, my lack of experience in debating in that realm. And then secondly, I felt even more pressure to actually perform and defend the, the Muslim position and defend our Palestinian brothers and sisters just because of the weight of the issue and, and what was going on. So mm-hmm. I, I, was, I was a bit more nervous. But in terms of the preparation, it was similar in that I I just watched a bunch of the interviews um, from the talk TV guys. And um, I call them dumb and dumber because really that's they got this like (laughs) almost three stooges, dumb and dumber act routine going on. Yeah, uh... I mean, really, and they try to be comical, but they're really just stupid. I'm sorry to say. Um, So I watched, you know, painstakingly watched a lot of. (laughs) <laughs> um, their interviews and specifically their interviews on um, Palestine and the, yeah. the pro-Palestinian guests that they had on. And, you know, obviously I recognized the pattern with them. They were like knockoffs of the uh, Pierce Morgan style type of interview where they typically came on and said, oh, you know, so Jake, do you condemn Hamas? Or uh, Jake, uh, do you condemn what happened on October the 7th? Or you know, all the, this, we know what they were into, that yeah. type of stuff. Uh, so they basically took the same pattern of interview of uh, Pierce Morgan. And to be quite honest, it is a difficult question for a Muslim to come on there and answer, especially from the um, context of being in the UK or in Britain. Why? Mm-hmm. Because um, they have prescribed Hamas now as a terrorist group. 
And so any what seems like support of Hamas could actually be have legal ramifications. Right. Now, in the U.S., we have the First Amendment to the Constitution, and we have a lot more freedom in terms of free speech. And so I had an advantage there in that if I wanted to openly defend Hamas, I wasn't really worried about uh, facing any legal ramifications. So I had an, uh, an additional, I think, advantage over many of the pro-Palestinian guests that had come on that were from the UK. Mm -hmm. However, I still had to maybe be careful about some of the things that I wanted to say. Um, but I was ready for, and I was prepping actually with s some other brothers that are close to me. I said, here's what I think is going to happen. And I even went through some practice um, conversations with uh, Brother Muhammad Hijab where he was right. actually grilling me. He was trying to act like the talk TV host, and he was grilling <laughs> me on uh, some questions, and uh, we were working on my response. But um, I was ready for, and I was sure that the first question they were going to ask me was, you know, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn the events that took place on October the 7th? Yeah. And, and to my surprise, that actually didn't happen. Um, the first question they asked me was like this silly question about what is metaphysician. a meta metaphysician. Yeah. And it was just clear That's that so they, silly. they didn't know. And so when I gave the answer then, in a case where they didn't know, they tried to come back with like a slick answer. And I was like, I mean, they just looked stupid. <laughs> um, but then the first real question they asked me um, was not about, hey, do you condemn October the 7th? Their first question was, Okay, Jake, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically, you know, with everything that's been going on over these past few months, how do we reach peace? Like, what's the pathway for peace? This was the basic question. And usually that comes at the end of these interviews. So I was yep. surprised. But I took my opportunity to answer the question by saying, you know, um, well, I think it's a difficult path to get towards peace. But the first thing we need to do is obviously to stop the occupation. We need to stop the atrocities that are being carried out against the Palestinian people. And we need to change the coverage that is going on in the media. And the first thing that we can do is address the media coverage that's been going on in this program. And with the defense of your own co-host, Ash, on this program, defending right. genocide of the Palestinian people. And they were like, what? You know, at first they were probably thinking, oh, we're giving this guy a softball to talk about, you know, how. And I just turned it down his head and I was like, no, the hell with that. You yeah. know, you, you guys are defending genocide on this program. You know, I'm going to pounce on you guys. And so I just pounced on them almost like a pit bull. And I would not let my bite go for 10 minutes. And I knew I only had 20 minutes on there. They were desperately trying to change the uh, subject, and 100%. I could have earlier. And I just, you know, beat them over the head with a bat until they, I said, "They until threatened, I said, you know, right?" At some point, if I remember, well, they were like, "Hey, you know, we're just gonna we're gonna kick oh, you yeah, out or the, something." The, yeah. The host, um, James Whale, yeah. genuinely was pleading with the um, producer of producer, the show, yes, remove yes, him from the show, and yeah. that was not an act. <laughs> some people think it's an act. It actually no, wasn't an act because. Be. If you go and watch the previous um, uh, discussions and interviews he held, yeah. he did that several times, and they actually did remove people yes. from the show. Yes. And yeah. the producer actually did not remove me from the show, I think because he knew it was good, quote-unquote, television at the time, because even though it was look, making them look in a bad position, he was probably thinking, well, a lot of people are going to want to see this. And the so clicks for sure. I, I, I am absolutely sure, although, you know, I, I didn't hear about it, but I'm sure there must have been a very difficult conversation that James Whale had with his producer after that program saying, hey, why didn't you get rid of that guy off the program? I told you to yeah. get him. And he just refused. And so I just went after him for another five or so minutes until they were practically begging for me, Jake, please change the conversation. <laughs> and, um, and I did. And then I just, you know, went on to uh, trying to get on get on them about some other topics but B between yeah. the three platforms so PBD talk TV and uh, peers 
Mm-hmm. Do you think their motives are for views and to get a good, good TV? Or do you think they have ulterior motives, such as supporting a certain agenda? Oh, yeah. I mean, without a doubt, I think it's uh, definitely towards views. Um, but they definitely have an agenda as well. I mean, let's be honest. Everyone has an agenda in a certain sense. Um, mm-hmm. If you mean by agenda uh, an objective or a goal that you're trying to reach with uh, your platform you guys have your own uh and i don't so i don't mean agenda in a bad sense um but it's obviously much better when your objective or agenda is clearly stated to your audience um i don't think pierce morgan i don't think talk tv or um pbd maybe a little bit more but to a lesser extent i don't think they clearly state some of their agendas that they have behind the scenes and so that's what's more problematic it's not really about having a goal or objective um, but when you're not clearly stating that to the audience and it seems like you're trying to get towards that end or goal in a malicious way that's when it becomes problematic so yeah they definitely do that i mean they definitely are trying to get views uh pierce morgan if you go and look it up you can research it Look at the number of subscribers he had before October the 7th and look at how many he has now. I think he's gained like almost 2 million subscribers on YouTube. He already had a big platform, but it really catapulted him even further. So he knew what he was doing and he would innocently try to say all the time, oh, I can't be so anti-Palestinian when I'm the host of a show that is having the most pro-Palestinian guests on. Well, Look, if you weren't getting views, you wouldn't be doing this over and over again. Right? 100%. <clears throat> so the Almost guy's like he was playing idiot. hero. Like, literally. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. So know, the he's, guy he's knew a exactly what he was solution. doing. Yeah, no, exactly. no doubt about it. Yeah. 100%. And, and, and to your point, uh, and I did definitely see this, like the, the trend, even viewership, subscribe yeah. count, um, no doubt about it. But it is it is definitely disingenuous, the approach that they take, because they, they kind of come across as, Oh, we're just trying to hear both sides. You know, we're just really trying to mediate mm. between the two. Right. When, in fact, to your point, like they have a more sinister goal or motive behind uh, behind these interviews. Let's be real. But yeah, do you yeah, think exactly. they're do you think they're being sinister because it gets more views, or because they are actually sinister? Um, I think it's both, but I think it's primarily because actually they're they're more sinister, and it just so happens that the um them getting more views is a byproduct of that uh to be honest with you so like uh for example i i mean i gave the example about pierce morgan but pbd and i i'm i'm trying to be fair that i think although i think he does have slightly a sinister agenda and to be fair he he does have a really big operation going on there he owns i think several different businesses um yeah. so i don't know how involved he is in terms of like let's his say, show selecting like it together yeah selecting the guests and everything because prior to us getting there actually on the day of the event of the podcast we had no direct communication with pbd whatsoever it was okay. all through email and phone correspondence with um if you guys watch the show or the viewers watch the show there's a guy, Rob, who actually sits yeah. in the room, and he's actually like the, the one. tech guy. Yeah, you know, he's the, the tech yeah. guy controlling the cameras and switching the camera angle and doing that kind of stuff. But as well as, I think he's responsible for getting the the talent or the uh, okay, putting okay. the production of the show. So, so we he was the one that yeah, you guys so, were coming. Okay, gotcha. Exactly. So he's the one that we were directly in contact with. Now, here's a question. If you want to have a good conversation and debate between two muslims and two christians in an informed somewhat academic setting would you want to have a career islamophobe two of them actually one in the english speaking world like robert spencer and brother rashid i don't think so now somebody could say jake it's your own biases but no even from a christian perspective I mean, I can think of a lot of other Christians that I, you know, vehemently disagree with, yeah. but I think would do a much better job uh, than they did, um, bring up more relevant topics to debate and discuss between us. So yeah. 
the first thing you got to think about is why did they have on these two career Islamophobes? Well, they knew what types of topics these guys would want to bring up. And Definitely. so my assumption is their plan was actually to bring on these two career Islamophobes, bring up all these shubuhat about, you know, that Western people would typically find problematic about, you know, penalty for apostasy and, you know, uh, supposed violence and this inherent violence in Islam and all yeah. these hot button topics that, you know, these guys have been pushing since 9-11, really. And, yeah. um, and to get us on the back foot to constantly just be defending Islam against these positions. But 100%. they weren't ready for Muslims. Like, I think their mistake was they maybe had done some scouting on Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa, but I think actually, when you think about it, the fact that we had a very short um, notice for the program and the fact that Brother Muhammad Hijab and Ali Dawa actually did the selecting of the Muslim guests, that put the Christian side at a disadvantage because 100%. they weren't able to prepare for us. And not to talk up myself or Daniel, um, but I just think that they weren't ready. They didn't know what they were getting. They probably oh, hadn't definitely. done much research on, on myself. And so they didn't they underestimated know what they were you guys. Getting. In yeah, all honesty, just, they did. That's all it was, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. no, definitely. And, 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 and the reality is, like, uh, once I get to your point, when you're picking these kinds of Islamophobes or career, uh, you know, Islamophobes, it's not no longer an academic debate. It doesn't really mm -hmm. become, it becomes like personal, almost like attacks literally against a religion yeah. as opposed to, you know, getting to some of the fundamentals and really having a proper discussion or at least the way pa Patrick Ben David was was pitching this at the time, mm. it was a way to kind of bring uh, Muslims and Christians together because of all of these things that are happening in the real world when it comes to like gender and, you know, all of these things that were basically playing out in real time mm. leading up to this debate. So mm. it, it was very weird for him to kind of come in with literally two career Islamophobes and kind of make it you know, under the guise of an academic debate when it really wasn't even mm -hmm. uh, the way he, he premised the first question. So to, to your point, totally, totally agree. And I, I definitely agree that they, they did underestimate you guys. Mm -hmm. So, so after, um, after the show, actually, uh, Robert Spencer sent out a tweet. I want to get your, your views on PBD's response to that tweet. So Robert says, watch PBD convert to Islam soon when the Islamic apologist on his show defended murdering people, blah, blah, blah. And then PBD responded <laughs> with, you sound bitter, upset, and frustrated. You were given an opportunity to come discuss the differences between Islam and Christianity. They seem prepared with pointed questions to ask, while you seem defensive. Mm -hmm. Being upset with your performance is understandable. Do you think this is PVD? Um, I mean, I guess, what's, what's your take on that? So, some people actually have uh, brought up like a conspiracy that they think that Robert Spencer and PVD were in on this and they were just playing it up and uh, I don't I really don't think that that was the case. I think that that was a genuine interaction. I think that PBD and his, you know, Rob and the rest of the guys who are Christians, I think that they were genuinely disappointed with the Christian performance and they were trying to keep it on the low, so they were trying to make it not so obvious even though if you read between the lines even in certain things that happened within the interview and discussion, you could kind of yeah. see PBD wasn't really feeling what they were saying and their performance. However, when Robert went out of his way to randomly attack a host who invited him on his program, <laughs> right? Then he was like, well, the hell with it, dude. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to let you know how I really feel. And you did a terrible job. And now you just seem bitter and you just seem like a crybaby loser. And uh, yep. I think that was a genuine uh, interaction. I think it was because he felt like, look, I invited these guys on. I was hoping that they would do a good job. They didn't. And now he's attacking me when it wasn't anything that I had to do with it. And, you know, what is he doing? So um, I think that was a genuine uh, response of frustration uh, from PBD there. I, I have a follow-up about that because I know you're obviously very – involved with dawah yeah. and let's move on to that segment for a bit but just taking pbd do you think he's the kind of person that would convert and the reason i ask is because christianity at a fundamental level at least and i would love to hear your perspective is 
There are inconsistencies in the logic that any person who approaches it from that perspective will think to themselves, I have to question this because it doesn't mm. make sense. My question is for PBD, someone at his intellect, someone that's as successful as him, how come he's still in that frame where he's not asking himself these deep questions? Do you think he's someone that would convert or at least start asking these questions? Um, I think it would be if, if people know his personal history and his background, I think it would be very difficult for somebody like him to convert to Islam. So for people who don't know, he's Iranian, he comes from Iran, um, actually fled Iran with his parents and wound up in a refugee camp, I think, in somewhere in Germany um, during the Iranian Revolution. And so he has a lot of, and, you know, reasonably so, for somebody in that situation, has a lot of animosity, I think, towards Islam. Now, you know, I'm a Sunni Muslim. So I would make the point to him that, look, those were the Shia in Iran that were doing that and would like to have a conversation about that. But um, nevertheless, I don't think he's making that distinction in his head. I think he sees that and what happened to him and his family um, as, a, as a problem with Islam. So that's the first mm -hmm. thing. So from a personal level, I think he's going to have difficulties. Second thing is now that he's been claiming to be Christian and that you know, part of his brand is, is being like a Christian right-wing type of talk ho show host. I think it would also be very difficult. Uh, he surrounded himself with a bunch of Christians. And uh, so I think it would be very difficult. Uh, third thing is uh, he's made millions of dollars. If people don't know, actually most of his money has been made in a haram way. Um, his money has come through um, the insurance company, and I don't. Without getting too technical, technical, the, there's usury involved, and so um, also it would affect his wealth. So I mean, there's so many things that I think would affect his personal relationship. That if he really embraced Islam, would be extremely difficult for him. Nevertheless. Um, Everything is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will, that he guides whomever he wills. Uh, right. So I can't say that it's impossible, but from a, from a, a dunyawi perspective, uh, it looks on a surface like there would be a lot of difficulty there. However, saying all that, we know some of the companions of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, um, actually were some of the biggest enemies against Islam uh, before they converted to Islam. And so if that can happen, then certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide somebody like Patrick but David to Islam. And we ask that Allah would do that. Um, I mean, but um, but yeah, it on the surface looks very difficult because of, you know, as I said, his background in the insurance company, his his history of uh, fleeing from Iran and uh, the perceived persecution that he thinks he felt and all that kind of stuff. And then the second thing would be <clears throat> some of the major problems that I had with Christianity that led me out of Christianity into Islam. I don't think that those are of genuinely, I don't think that they're of much importance to Patrick. Why do gotcha. I say that? Because things like the Trinity, how is God one and three at the same time? How is Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, fully God and fully man at the same time. You know, how did he know everything and yet he was ignorant of certain things? How does this make any sense? I mean, for just a common person without getting too difficult into things, this doesn't really make sense. And I think Patrick recognizes that, but he just doesn't really care about it genuinely. Why? Because if you notice, Patrick explicitly tried to steer away from theology or Tawheed in the discussion that we had with these two Islamophobes. Mm -hmm. I wanted to bring up the Trinity because this is a major difference between us and the Christians, right? We believe yep. that shirk is the only un unforgivable sin. And so if you're worshiping a man, which the Christians are doing, doesn't matter all the other good things that they're doing, whether they're against LGBTQ or all these other things, and I don't want to get the this channel flagged or anything, but, um, <laughs> you know, all the other things that we would agree with them about, in the end, it doesn't matter because they're worshiping a man. 
That's what Islam says, right? All their deeds are null and void if they're, you know, committing shirk and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from our perspective of da'wah and following, hopefully, in the footsteps of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, we have to focus on the oneness of God first, right? The Prophet, peace be upon him, focused on the oneness of God for, it said, about 13 years before he even went to other things, right? And that's because he was coming from a, a polytheistic environment where that was his primary da'wah in the beginning. Yep. And so yes, if you don't get that right, we don't need to start talking about all these other nitty gritty issues, right? Yeah. And um, so that's always been my approach and my focus. Um, but when I tried to, when I tried to, you know, stick my foot in the door there and uh, pry it open and, and try to get into the meat of what I think the real issues are and talk about the Trinity, they wanted no part of it. The Christians, the actual guests wanted no part of it. PBD wanted no part of it. I got to squeeze it in for about like maybe seven or up to ten minutes, something like right. that. And then very quickly when I, Robert Spencer was on the back seat, uh, back foot, and he had no answer to the questions I was asking, PBD actually explicitly said, let's move on. We don't really want to talk about that stuff. Right, and right. then he went back to more of you know, social issues and political issues and that kind of stuff. Why? Because as a person, genuinely, he's more concerned about the practical side of Islam and Christianity in terms of dealing with it from a dunyawi perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Finance, politics, society, which is all important for um, Islam as well. But he only wants to focus on that. And several times throughout the discussion, he, he said, he, he constantly, you know, makes this uh, statement about, you know, no, well, nobody actually really knows what happens when we're going to die, right? Are we going to die and just be worm food? Are we going to die and see Jesus Christ? You know, mm -hmm. are we going to die and, you know, is it going to be the Islamic narrative? He's like, nobody really knows. It's all faith at the end of the day. It's all, and he, the way he presents it is as if, as if it's all sort of blind faith and it's based on our experience with God and not really taking into account reason and these type of things. And therefore, he sees it as a very private affair, as the West would, would like to make it, <clears throat> which in Islam it's not. It's a very community-based um, yes. uh, religion. And um, so I think with all of these differences... To answer Brother Abdullah's question, is it's I, I really think he I don't think he's trying to just avoid it for the sake of it. I think he genuinely doesn't care about those aspects of religion which Islam would consider extremely important. So it sounds like he just has a lot to gain from being, or a lot to keep gaining from being a Christian. That's one of the main yeah. things you said. So a lot of dunya materialism. Why do you mm -hmm. think? Most Christians who don't have access to that kind of wealth, who are just regular Christians, why do, why do you think most Christians don't reconsider their beliefs? Wow. I mean, it's such a difficult question because um, I think, you know, in, in, in my Dawa, um, I'm very much against um, what I would call a one size fits all approach. And I, I'm going to get around to answering your question. Um, in other words, what is it that makes people convert to Islam? Well, for me, it was easy. I mean, once I recognized that I could still believe in Jesus and yet not believe that he was God, not believe that he died for my sins, not believe that he was part of a trinity, believe that God was one, that we were going to be held accountable for what we did and our actions and our intentions, and... Once I just understood the Islamic message, which I never knew prior to reading the Qur'an, nobody had to give me da'wah and convince me. I just read the Qur'an and accepted it off of that. For some people, that may not be the case. I've always been, you know, to my, to my parents' <laughs> own uh, unfortunate uh, dealings with me, I've always been somewhat of a rebellious person. Um, I never really cared about what anybody else thought in the sense that if I thought that something was right, I don't care. And, and, and really, um, it, it's not a good thing because in Islam, you know, your parents are really important 
we have to respect what they say as long as they're not trying to, uh, you know, sway you from the truth in terms of guidance. But um, I didn't care if my parents thought that I was nuts for wanting to embrace um, this religion of Islam. I, I genuinely didn't care. I was going to do it anyway. Uh, but for other people, that's really difficult in the modern day age and in the West. Um, so it might not be as easy as just reading the Quran and understanding what it teaches to accepting the religion. Um, if we think about the example of the Sahaba, right, and how they became Muslims, some of them it was because of the character of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. They yeah, knew so, him. So. They knew that he was a truthful person, and all it took was for him to say that I am a Nabi, I am a prophet. And they said, look, we know he's a, the most truthful person. He never lies. We accept it. They didn't even have to hear anything else. Other people, it was um, the majesty of and the miracle of the Qur'an. How amazing it was and how it could not be uh, human speech that when they heard it, they said, wow, this is, must be from the Creator. Mm -hmm. Other people's, it, it was the miracles of the Prophet والسلام, that he performed. So... My, my point of getting to your question about, well, why are different people not um, accepting Islam? I would refer back to because different people accept Islam for different reasons. And so because of that, they're also going to reject Islam or not accept Islam for different reasons. So it's a really complicated question. For some yeah. people, it may be because of... Um, uh, financial aspect. They understand that Islam is true, but if they accept it, that's going to affect their wealth. They can't um, deal in usury anymore or interest anymore. Um, and we know that's a big problem in Western society, right? It's just all over. Um, for other people, it may be because of uh, family pressures. They think that, well, if they convert and they tell their parents, or they may even be married to a non-Muslim. Well, now it's going to ruin their marriage, and they've got kids already. Or what's you know what's going to happen with their uh, relationships? For other people, um, they may have genuine, sincere questions about Islam that they don't understand and that they have difficulties with. That could be the case. For other people, it could be uh, media manipulation and certain Western narratives that have corrupted. Um, unfortunately. Uh, Western non-Muslims into thinking, well, Islam is just about this or all of these Islamic phobic tropes that uh, Robert Spencer spins and, mm -hmm. and their likes. And so they've been affected by that and that's, they hate Islam because of that. So there are all different sorts of reasons why some may be legitimate, others not. And, and so, you know, a large part of my dawah, um, I'd like to try to get to know the person uh, personally and see what is really their reason because it may not be as simple as just disproving the Trinity maybe they know the Trinity is false and they don't really care about that but they're concerned with how their mother or their wife is going to react to them accepting Islam so they want to be told about how to deal with that Jake how did you deal with that um, mm -hmm. and I, maybe they want to just talk about that so I think it's important to get to people to know people as individuals and deal with them uh, on an individualistic uh, basic in terms of giving them what they, they really need in any given circumstance. I love that. Honestly, that makes the most sense, to be honest, because Dawa is supposed to be a more personable mm -hmm. type of interaction. Everyone has, uh, you know, it's almost like a disease and a cure. You can't just yes. use one pill for everything, right? You have right. to find out what the disease is and then you, you tackle it systematically. Uh, right, and yeah. if you if you do rush it, you could actually even, you know, kill the guy. So mm -hmm. it, it's it's the same kind of approach, right? Some people run away from Islam with a specific a Dawah mm -hmm. approach compared to others. Um, right. No, I, I appreciate that. All right, we're going to switch gears, inshallah. We're going to go to another uh, segment of ours where mm -hmm. we talk about some trending affairs. So this is where mm -hmm. um, ideally there are going to be about three stories that we just want to cover and maybe get your perspective about it. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you're aware of this. But literally, this happened yesterday. Uh, Candace Owens was uh, essentially fired from the Daily Wire. Mm. Um, what do you What do you think really happened there? What What do you think is the, the real story? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I put a tweet about this yesterday. I'm not sure if, if you guys or the viewers have seen this. Um, but I tweeted out a recent interview that she actually had on the Daily Wire program when she was still pro part of it on her YouTube channel. And um, it was with this rabbi. Man, I, I'm blanking on his name at the moment. But this, Barkley. Yeah, yeah, Barkley. There you go. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Um, and basically, as far as I understand it, this guy Barkley, this rabbi Barkley, he had written several like hit pieces against Candace Owens, calling her and you know an anti semite and all. She hates Jews and all these different kind of derogatory claims against her. And um, so she invited him on for him to attempt to defend his accusations against her and obviously for her to rebut them and respond to them. <clears throat> and for anybody who watches it, I think genuinely, and I'm no big fan of Candace Owens, I'm not like, you know, cheering her on type of thing, but I have to be honest in this situation and say, this guy was so dishonest in his accusation and 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 claims against Candace Owens that it's really not even funny like um I'll give just one example I think um there's one example where Candace Owens was I think doing a lecture or like a Q&A somewhere and she was asked a question about nationalism what does she think about nationalism yeah and she responded and said, basically, and I'm, I'm, par you know, I'm summing it up, so forgive me, but <clears throat> she basically said she doesn't really have a problem with nationalism. She thinks mm -hmm. that in the West and in certain places, nationalism, the term, has gotten a bad rep because it's been associated with Hitler. It's been associated with Hitler that he was a nationalist, and therefore nationalism as a whole must be a bad ideology because it's necessarily associated with Hitler. And her point was, yeah, Hitler was a really bad guy, but just because he was a terrible human being and she doesn't support anything that he did to the Jewish people doesn't mean that we should throw out the term nationalism and get rid of it as a concept. We don't support his form of supposed nationalism, in which case she thought he wasn't even genuinely a nationalist anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the guy then, Rabbi Barkley, spun this, and actually in an article, he wrote, I think, I think I'm quoting him accurately, where he said, Candace Owens does not have a problem with Hitler. Yeah, yeah, And, did, and yeah. without any context whatsoever. Now, if somebody saw that, most people, what do they think about when they think of Hitler? He was a racist loser who hated Jews and wanted to exterminate an entire people. He wanted to commit genocide on the Jewish people and killed millions and millions of innocent Jewish people, right? And yeah. we as Muslims are totally against what Hitler did. So the first person, I mean, the first thing that a person thinks of, if I were to say, hey, Brother Abdullah here, you know, he actually doesn't have a problem with Hitler. What would people think? They would say, Brother Jake, what are you talking about? Why would you say such a thing about him? He never said anything like that, right? In fact, we probably have a big problem after this discussion. And so it was so dishonest for him to put it in that way without any context whatsoever and misconstrue yeah. <clears throat> what she was actually saying. And yeah, so it, it, imagine that exponentially over what happened in the whole rest of the interview. One yeah. by one, all of his statements and accusations were just complete nonsense. And, and, uh, and totally, it's like it was just so absurd what he was accusing her of. And she defended herself, I think, very well and made him look so desperate and like a dishonest fool that by the end of it, her Jewish, at the time, handlers, uh, Ben Shapiro and the people at... Uh, you know, the Daily Wire just couldn't deal with this any longer. And they said this was the camel, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, and they fired her. That's genuinely what I believe happened. That makes sense. And honestly, I think that's, that's pretty much where my views are, to be honest, with, with regards to this as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and just the overall smear campaign, like, <laughs> she's been getting... 
uh, bashed by them for for months now, literally just because mm-hmm. she refuses to side with Israel. Uh, you right. Know, with all. Exactly. So, and and I find it very funny, especially with that hit piece that uh, that he wrote, mm. because funny enough, it's talking about nationalism overall, exactly. and Israel as a as a Zionist state is literally <laughs> like it's exactly. literally Hitler's mentality, but. You know, with the with a I know, you know it was so, Jewish backing. It's so funny, brother, that uh, actually in the very beginning, since he's accusing Candace Owens of being an anti-Semite, basically somebody who hates Jews. Well, we ought to define what an anti-Semite actually is, and it mm-hmm. turns out the guy actually says, "Well, anti-Semitism is basically can be defined a different way." You know, depending on what year it is. Yes. I mean, yes. <laughs> Candace Owens is like, really, bro? You sound like you're down with like the BLM movement here and what how they're using like the term racism and stuff like that. And um, not really to go too much into that, but I mean, he was just like, she was just like, this is nonsense, man. This is some wacko like postmodernism idea of you have this idea of. Anti-Semitism is a special term that can change its definition based on, you know, what day of the week it is. I mean, yeah, seriously, yeah. I mean, feel? it's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It what is, side of the is. bed you wake up on? So <laughs> nobody Literally. was buying that. And the guy just looked like a complete clown. I mean, honestly. So no. after that, I mean, I think the Daily Wire was like, yeah, we got to cut ties with Candace. Like, she's Which not is... aligned with it. and she's not she's genuinely not no. aligned with them on this yeah, zionist campaign so therefore yeah, yeah. bye bye I, mean. I just find it funny because uh, the daily wire has always had this um tone of anti or anti cancel culture and here they mm. are literally canceling someone and I, i'm sure it's not where it, where it ends right like I, I feel like i think a lot of people are anticipating a huge hate com- campaign mm. coming right after this like this is just the start I expect probably all of these news stations and who knows what to write more hit pieces, talk about it now that it's official, like literally just destroy her reputation, and mm. character assassination, literally at its at its finest. What do you mm. what do you think are her her next moves now? Does she go independent like uh, a Tucker Carlson? Does she like you know align herself with another uh, you know another platform or what would you I, say? Would... I think at the start she's definitely just going to be independent. I would be surprised if she very quickly. Um, signed on with somebody else. I could mm-hmm. be totally wrong, but if it were a perfect match for her, as far as she's concerned, she'd probably go for it. But I think she, right now, it would go more the Tucker Carlson route, and I think that's probably best for her um, because then she can be fully independent and say whatever she wants and however she feels, and I think that's, at this point, most important for her from her own perspective. Yeah. And I think that's what the route that she would go. Um, she might sign on with somebody else down the road but i don't think that's going to happen immediately that makes sense that makes yeah. sense did you hear about the uh the bosco um attack there the the uh you know all of a sudden 10 years later isis decided to just wake up and uh you know <laughs> i alive a bunch of uh of russians like do you think that actually is true in the sense that this was actually isis I know that Russia recently just came out and said that no, it was actually the Ukrainians. Mm-hmm. What's your what's your take on this? To be honest with you, it, it just happened recently, and I, I I I have heard about it, but I haven't gone too much into detail on it, and so I think it would be wrong for me really to comment too much in detail because I, I I I'm not really sure um, who exactly was involved. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm skeptical of the reports on both sides. Yeah, especially um, if it's fresh like that. Yeah, so I, I really don't know. Um, I'm interested to, to hear more details and how the story develops, but I, I really don't know at this point. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on it. I'd like to hear what you have to say. So there, there was one of the, the captives that they got, um, and it's it's all over Twitter. Like, you can probably watch that video mm-hmm. um, where they just ask him, like, you know, what, what where, where, where did you come from? Like, what, what incited you? To, to do this kind of uh, violent act and he just says like oh i got hired from telegram mm. and they just gave me a bunch of weapons and they promised me like a million rubles or half a million i can't remember the exact amount but they mm. basically promised him exchange of money uh the guy definitely looks like a little bit uh you know de- like not russian necessarily mm. uh, but uh but yeah i mean the whole thing just thinks a lot of conspiracy at the end of the day i'm not a huge conspiracy theorist let's put it mm. that way but mm. 
it is kind of weird <laughs> things lined up the way they did so fast so quickly mm-hmm. um, especially when Israel is really at that point where and I'm not saying it was a you know Israel but you, you just you never know right and that's that's the whole fog of war mentality it's like it just every all the lines are so blurred that it's mm-hmm. almost hard to do it with certainty mm-hmm. now the Russians themselves are saying that this was Ukrainians uh, who kind of staged the attack or paid someone who knows if this is just a way to kind of continue their their war with them or right. uh, so yeah to your point like for sure because it's it's just developing it's hard to to say but i do think that i would be remiss if i didn't assume that this was some some power out there that's trying to just kind of expand war or distract people from the current situation in israel at the moment it with the ge- just the genocide we- Honestly, it, it very much could be. Yeah, I, like I wouldn't put it past them. No, that, I wouldn't. And, and, and I don't know if you guys have seen this um, interview. Um, there was a I think he was a spokesman for Israel um, was on a, on a news channel on a Russian news channel um, mm-hmm. recently. And he actually was threatening the Russian host. He was saying, look, when when this is all over, we're going to destroy you know, Hamas and uh, Gaza and everything. And he's like, when yeah. we're done with Gaza, we're coming for Russia. I mean, he was saying this and, and the guy's like, why are you saying that? Well, because Russia is backing our enemies. And there's a claim that Russia is supposedly, you know, partially backing um, Hamas and stuff like that. Right, and right. so I- I'm not saying that definitely, but there is an argument and definitely a possibility um, for the for the argument that, uh, Israel could def- have, you know, some well, part in it. Yeah, because they want to get back at the Russians, and also they want to get the story and the heat off of <clears throat> what they're doing and the atrocities they're carrying out in Gaza. Yeah. So I don't know that that's the case. Uh, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist either, but uh, what, you know, everything that has happened since October the 7th and the amount of lies that have been told, the blatant lies that have been that's told. That's the key, yeah. Uh, I, I just... I wouldn't put it past him, really, to be honest. Yeah, but I'm, yeah. I'm that, not sure. Really I don't want to pe- people to think to say Jake is saying for this sure, definitely sure. happened in this way. Um, there, there could be other nefarious entities that are involved as well. I really don't yeah. know. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Once again, it is very fresh. I mean, the the story will probably play out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, very, very exactly. likely. Inshallah. I don't think it's one of those like stories that's going to end here, especially with the like the. Uh, uh, the stakes at 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 hand. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you think about this whole TikTok ban that's been really pushed uh, forth, at least in the U.S.? Just the ability to you know completely destroy one of uh, the most popular way to to communicate with one another or to bring out information. Uh, mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I think it's just a ba- a simple battle between America and China and the kind of um, you can say war that they have going on right now. Um, yeah. And I think they are genuinely concerned with uh, the data that China is uh, accumulating and maybe using to their advantage. Um, so I think there there's definitely a genuine concern about that. I don't know how much deeper it goes than this simply just being a battle between America and China uh, I'm pretty sure that that's really all it is. I, like I said, sure. it could be more than that, but I don't know. That that's fair. That's fair. I, just I guess a point of um, concern, I guess, for a lot of people is just maybe at the beginning of the war. Uh, I wouldn't really call it war; more like genocide. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a leaked audio from the ADL that we're talking about. You know how we have a current generational issue. Um, specifically with TikTok. He was saying we have a TikTok problem. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of people have kind of made the parallel that maybe this is also another, like, you know, hit from the higher powers <laughs> that be mm-hmm. from the from the Zionist side, kind of pushing, uh, pushing forth, rather, uh, the TikTok ban because of just the amount of uh, positive mm-hmm. uh, Palestinian sentiment that's come out of it since the beginning, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely possible. And... and, and um just as China and Russia are sort of aligned in the sense of uh, being against the West, uh, being yeah. against uh, uh, the U.S., 
we also, of course, know that <laughs> U.S. and Israel are aligned. So it's it's not necessarily an either or because I think they they have similar interests in that way, and so mm, gotcha. uh, the interests that the U.S. have against China are s- similar to the interests that Israel would as well. Uh, they're sort of maybe backing each other up. So that's definitely uh, probably a part of it as well. Last uh, last one of those uh, trending uh, topics. Uh, there's a big, big, big push on socials these days to talk about the red uh, heifer, essentially, like the, the red cow that... Because uh, mm. there was a story that basically uh, they imported some from, I think, Texas it was, yeah. a number of them. Um, so tell us a little bit about, about that prophecy. Like, what is that prophecy all about? And um, it, if it's true, I'm not saying whether or not it is true or anything like that, but we do know that mm. there is like religious uh, reasons for, for why we should believe that this is something that is part of their agenda. But why are Zionists so keen on speeding up the end of times, like just kind of rushing it, getting it to the last stage? Like you would expect people to just be like, you know, enjoy life, you know, peace and all that. But there's this real um, rush to kind of just speed it all up and get to the end of they times as soon the as possible. Jet. <laughs> Literally, like yeah. unlock him. You yeah. Know? So, um, just a quick little background um, on Judaism for people who don't know. Um, the Jews believe in a concept of the Messiah, uh, similar to how uh, Muslims and Christians do. The difference between the three religions is obviously that Christians uh, believe that the Messiah is God. We think Jews and Muslims think that that's blasphemous, and um, uh, Muslims believe in a concept of Messiah, and we believe it's Jesus, but we don't believe he's God, right? Just in simple terms. Right. Um, the Jews um, believe that that's blasphemous or problematic, and they believe that the Messiah is not Jesus, peace be upon him, and is yet to come. So, with all of that said, all of these sort of end-time prophecies and everything like that are in the mind of a Zionist Jew, are to usher in the Messianic age in which the Messiah will come, and their idea is that there will then be peace and justice fully established on earth, and yada, yada, yada. Okay, so that's why they want it to happen. But there are some steps, there are some incremental steps that need to take place in their own mind and there's dispute about this in Judaism, to be fair. Mm-hmm. But some Zionist Jews believe that um, they need to play an active role in making these prophecies uh, come about or for them to be fulfilled. Rather than letting God just do what he's supposed to do, uh, no, they think that they all have to have an active role in making these prophecies come about. Okay. So one of them is this idea of these red heifers or these red cows, essentially, that need to be, um, and there's, it's very specific. They can't have um, uh, this, this white hairs. They need to be perfectly pristine in terms of their, um, their coat and everything like that. Uh, there are several details about the red hair and how old it must be and all these different kind of weird details. And the idea is that these red heifers must be in this perfect condition that is prophesized and they must be sacrificed in a particular location in, quote unquote, Israel in order to usher in the Messianic age and the establishment of what's called the third temple. Right. So because for people who don't know, um, the Jews had a temple, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Temple Mount and the Wailing yep. Wall and all this kind of stuff. And um, they initially had a temple. It was destroyed. It was rebuilt. And then it was destroyed again um, in, in the, uh, around the year 70. Um, and ever since, it's, it's not been rebuilt, right? And the idea is that the uh, Messianic Age is going to come with the establishment of a third temple. In order for that to happen, there must be these red heifers, which they sacrifice in this particular location in, uh, quote-unquote, Israel. So this is all related, and it's, it's actually in the Bible. You can find it in certain biblical passages. Um, not to do a shameless plug of my channel, but I have a video on this on my YouTube channel 
where I go into a lot more detail on exactly uh, what these Zionist Jews are saying, what the prophecy supposedly is, and, and seeing it in real lifetime, actually, it's, it's funny, actually, sad, uh, but funny, at the same time that there are Christian Zionists, not only Jewish Zionists, that there are some Christian Zionists that buy into all this garbage and are trying to actually help the Jewish Zionists fulfill all of this stuff so that it can usher in the Messianic age. Now, of course, yep. they believe at that time that Jesus will come back and that he'll actually kill all the Jews. But <laughs> nevertheless, they're still working with the Jews to um, try to make this happen. It's just bizarre to me. But um, actually, from what I understand, the Texas farmers that are responsible for actually breeding this uh, these he heifers, excuse me, um, are actually Christian Zionists. And they actually ha took part in importing these gotcha. red heifers over to Israel and, you know, all this kind of nonsense. So the Jews and the Christian Zionists are actually working together to try to usher in some of these prophecies for them to be fulfilled so that the Messiah for the Jew uh, Christians will come back or for the Jews will come for the first time. So uh, that, that's the basic idea, but I go a lot uh, into a lot more detail on it. And, and I don't just say these things. I, I give video evidence from Christians and Jews uh, and from their scripture, uh, you know, saying this and admitting this. That's amazing. Yeah. Jake, there's, um, I want to move on to one of the last sections we have. So we have a group of uh, impossible questions that I want to ask you. Oh, <laughs> well, hopefully um, I have uh, decent answers. <laughs> so if you could ask Lost Planet Idol one question about his creation that has puzzled you, what would it be? And why would you ask? Oh, boy. <laughs> um... And I ask this because you're a very philosoph philosoph philosophical guy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, man, that's hard. Cause I, I could think of certain, I could think of certain selfish questions to ask about myself. Um, man, I really don't know. <laughs> that's, that's such a hard question. <laughs> I, 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 the, the things that come immediately to mind are certain things that happened to me in my life that I don't understand or that I don't yet understand and that mm -hmm. I would like answers to, uh, maybe some difficult things that happened to me. Um, but I, I feel like that's kind of a selfish answer. I don't know. No, that makes sense. So you're basically waiting for the wisdom behind certain events. Yeah. That happened. The wisdom, that's, that's the so wisdom fair. behind that certain events that happened to me specifically. Um, but there are other things that I'm curious about um in the wisdom behind uh certain events that are happening like i mean even the wisdom behind what's happening in palestine right like i can i can think of certain wisdom that's happening behind that but we don't really ever fully know um so i, I would say just generally why certain things are happening that we don't understand uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine plan and why they're happening yeah. and i'm a naturally curious person so not in a sense of like, oh, that it's a shubha or a doubt or yeah. contention. It's just like I'm really curious to see the end of the story and how these things are uh, connected. Almost like, and I'm not, uh, you know, for Allah, not comparing myself to Musa Islam as a prophet, but the story of Musa Islam always gives me comfort in this regard that he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he had difficulty in understanding why um, Khidr was actually doing some of the things that he was doing. Why was he doing yeah. this? Why was he doing this? And um, he was told from the beginning, Musa, you're not going to be able to be patient with me, right? And it's because um, uh, Khidr actually had a certain type of uh, knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Musa alayhi salam did not have at that point. And because mm. he didn't have that knowledge, he didn't understand why certain things were happening, right? And But by the end of the story, he, he was told, look, I told you, you weren't going to be able to be patient with me. And, and he said, now I'm going to tell you why everything happened. This happened because of this, and this happened because of this. And at the end, 
uh, Musa alayhi salam was sort of like regretful, almost like, he's like, wow, subhanAllah, like now he really understood why everything was happening in the manner that it was. Yeah. And so um, it's always comforting to me that if a prophet, uh, peace be upon him, um, had difficulty understanding that, um, that it's no surprise that, you know, human, other human beings would have that. And so, um, yeah, selfishly, certain things that have happened in my life, I wonder about, like, you know, some things I, I kind of have an idea, okay, you know, you see the wisdom in that, like, 10 years later, or maybe even 10 days later, wow, you know, I understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed that to happen, or he willed that to happen. Uh, but some things are still kind of a head scratcher, you know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, some of those, uh, getting the, the hikmah or the wisdom behind some of those things is um, probably what I would ask about, yeah. Would, would you say it's wise for someone to try to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's nature outside of the Quran and Sunnah? So for example, asking yeah. oneself like, how does free will uh, work? Um, so I think... Um, I think it's good, but only if you do so responsibly. So it could have serious consequences. Like for me, when I say it genuinely, I'm saying it as a point of curiosity. It's not something mm -hmm. that keeps me up at night, like is really bothering me and hurting me and like, oh, Allah, ya Allah, if, if you don't give me this answer, uh, I'm going gonna, gonna to blow my dean or I'm going to lose yeah, sleep yeah. over it. If it's getting to that point, then it's really not healthy because we should go back to the story of Musa salam, and actually the hikmah in that story, the wisdom behind that story, I believe, and um, um, the exegetes of the Quran actually talk about this, is that the hikmah for us is not that, oh, we are therefore going to know and understand all of the things eventually that... Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in mind. No, it's actually that we are not prophets of God and that we are going to find ourselves in that stage that Musa alayhi salam found himself in. And because we don't have somebody like Khidr or we're not receiving wahi or divine revelation to tell us the hikmah behind these things, we may never know in this life. And we have mm -hmm. to be uh, comfortable with that because we have to trust and have faith, have iman in the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does have a genuinely good reason for allowing and willing certain things to happen. So um, 100%. that's why we have to be careful and not getting too crazy thinking about it. Like um, even, even the example that I used before about Brother Muhammad Hijab, that's how I see it in my life that he... Um, he basically gave up one opportunity to get a greater opportunity, right? right? And that may be true, but it may only be part of it. Or it may not be true. I, I may be reading mm -hmm. the situation wrong. I don't know. Um, so I think it's fine to try to understand why certain things are happening in our life, but not to get too hung up on it to the point that it, it bothers us and, and becomes uh, problematic. Yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah. Here's another question for you. Um, if you had to debate one group of individuals for the rest of your life, what faith would, what faith would that be? Um, probably Christians. <laughs> um, atheists really uh, annoy me. Um, Why is that? I, you know, I've spent a lot of time debating atheists and... Not to say that they, some of them are, don't have genuine concerns, but... It's almost like, you know, the concept of not believing in God is so foreign to me that I, mm -hmm. I sympathize with it a lot less, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I find okay. it uh, more strange and uh, less defensible. Whereas, at least when it comes to Christianity or Judaism or other religions that believe in God, it's like, okay, they believe in God, they believe in a creator, but they have a misunderstanding of who that creator is. They have a misunderstanding of his commands to his creation. And so uh, there's a little bit more commonality and room for dialogue, I think, of, or equal footing. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, I guess selfishly, because I uh, originally come from a Christian background, and um, 
And so I'm more interested in why do people believe in Christianity? Why do they not want to accept Islam uh, coming from that perspective that I, I probably would want to spend more time um, debating Christians, yeah. And if you could only use one argument or one topic in the Bible to debate Christians on for the rest of your life, what would that be? Oh, boy. Um, it would probably be surrounding around uh, uh, Jesus' supposed divinity, um, and which is obviously related to the Trinity. So, you know, and, and really that's because um, I try to, although I'm very flawed, uh, pattern my da'wah around what I think the Prophet والسلام, would do. And um, I think, obviously with the Christians, he would spend the most time talking about uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, and him being a prophet and, and not divine, not God. So um, I, would, I would focus on that. Yeah. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, the last question I had, and I want to try to phrase this as... Um, as best as possible so you can understand what I'm trying to ask, but mm -hmm. how, how is it possible to engage in interfaith dialogue when we know we have the ultimate truth and people on the other side, they want to engage in something that's a bit more um, on even standing where it's like, let's try to uncover the truth together and if you uncover it or if I uncover it, we'll, we'll take it. But ultimately as Muslims, we know we're never going to leave the faith. Right. So um, this is interesting and um, it relates to something that actually bothers me about some some Muslims, and it's a really it's a, it's just something I quibble over. Some Muslims say we are truth seekers, right? We're truth seekers. I don't call myself a truth seeker. Why? Because I believe that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, first of all, is Al Haq. He is the truth, and whatever He says is the truth. And I believe that the Qur'an is a true revelation from him. And therefore, everything that the Qur'an says is the truth. So I already believe that I'm in possession of the truth. I'm not seeking the truth to try to find out what the ultimate truth is. I am seeking to better understand the truth. In other words, I understand that Islam is true, that there's a creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the Qur'an and the Sunnah are the truth. And I may, I'm not, of course, I'm ignorant of many things within that scope. So I'm seeking to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala better. I'm seeking to understand uh, the Prophet and his mission better, uh, alayhi salatu wasalam. But I'm not so, seeking to find out, well, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Quran true? You see the difference? There's a difference yeah. between seeking the ultimate truth and trying to find out what actually is it and seeking to better understand that truth. So I don't consider myself a truth seeker in that sense. And I get a little bit annoyed when Muslims call themselves uh, truth seekers. So, um, and I think it's related to what you're saying here. When dealing with whether it's Christians or Jews or atheists or Hindus or whoever they are, um, we have the truth. So how, how is it that we can genuinely engage in a dialogue with them? Well, of course... We also believe in virtue of us having the truth. They, by you know, necessity, because they're not Muslims, they don't have the truth. And so our obligation as Muslims is to convey the truth to them while at the same time not making ourselves a barrier between them and the truth. Now, that is the difficult part because that's when... Your ego gets involved. Uh, that's when um, personal issues, maybe with the person that you're talking to, get involved. Um, that's when, you know, certain things that are so obvious to you and that should be nullifiers of Christianity, uh, you think, well, I mean, it worked for me, so it should be so obvious into working for him. And then you think, well, why is that not actually happening? Is he just dishonest? Is he sincere, but he doesn't really care about what, what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. So the real difficulty in Dawa is proclaiming the truth and at the same time not allowing yourself to be an impediment between yourself, uh, I'm sorry, between the, uh, the truth and th that other p person. And that is, uh, I think, the most difficult problem. It's not that we have the truth and they don't. That's, that's just obvious. 
It's that how do we explain to them that Islam is the truth and what they have is not the truth without making ourselves a barrier between them and the actual truth? And that's difficult, you know. Um, there are many challenges that come said. with that. That was, that was uh, some some really, really good uh, gem of wisdom, <laughs> if I can say so. Yeah. Anyways, we're at, we're at the end of our of our episode here, Jake. We do uh, honestly want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for for taking the time. I know you have a quite busy schedule, and um, uh, inshallah, we really hope to do this again. I think this was a, a fun conversation overall, and I think there's a lot of other topics that we didn't get to talk about mm -hmm. today that I would have loved to pick your uh, pick your brain about. Mm -hmm. uh, but tell our audience wh where can they find you? What what are your your handles for your socials? What are some projects that you're working on? Yeah, so the main places you can find me is on uh, YouTube and Twitter. That's where I mostly am. Uh, you can find me, just type in The Muslim Metaphysician, and uh, you'll, you'll find me on YouTube and Twitter. I'm also on Facebook, but not as active. I'm also on uh, TikTok, but not that active, uh, just because, I, you know, trying to get acclimated to all these different platforms and really puts time and effort into them is 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 difficult i'm sort of spread thin but uh the best places to follow me right now are on youtube and twitter uh just type in the muslim metaphysician or you can type in my name too jake brancatella which is my full uh name uh, and you can find me there uh right now um also actually um I might as well mention this i've also recently started another youtube channel which is called political alchemy and there, we're just getting started, me and, and actually Brother Sharif, uh, we've kick-started a project. We've, we've, spent, we've put a lot of money and time and effort into it, uh, setting up a professional studio. And um, uh, we're just in the beginning stages, but that will focus primarily on um, political events, political news. And the reason why we did that is because we saw that the Zionists were lying so much about the events happening in Palestine, we thought, well, we're not really doing enough. We, we really need to set up a platform where Muslims can convey their views and explain, you know, what's happening, the current events, but from a traditional Sunni Muslim perspective without the sort mm -hmm. of um, constraints that other platforms may have. So uh, that's on political alchemy. Uh, I recommend people go check it out. Go over there and subscribe. Uh, we're just starting to make a bunch of videos over there. And so my political commentary and stuff related to Palestine, things like that, will primarily take place over there. And then on my, my channel, the Muslim Metaphysician will primarily be related to Islam, uh, theology, Dawah to Christians and atheists, and things of that sort. Solid, solid. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. That's that's amazing. I'll definitely check that channel out, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, uh, Abdullah, any any last uh, words that you want to just impart before we uh, we close this off? Yeah, man, just barakallah fiqh to Jake. I reached out to you randomly on uh, X. Didn't expect you to reply. You did. Alhamdulillah, we got it oh, booked. And um, just can't thank you enough, bro. And inshallah, if you've enjoyed the episode, uh, to the viewer, if you've enjoyed the episode, just share it. Sharing mm -hmm. is caring. We don't want you to comment, like, nothing, none of that. Just mm -hmm. share with other people. That's all that matters to us. Inshallah. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. And uh, yeah, definitely... Uh, Hopefully we can do this again sometime and get into some other things. I know it's right around the hour and a half mark, so I think we we did a pretty good job, but I'm sure there may be other things you guys would like to get to. So definitely. Definitely, inshallah. definitely. Awesome, awesome. Well, we'll take you up upon it, inshallah. Inshallah. All right, guys, till next time. Peace out. Assalamu